want to keep using this this workshop we will be checking out the other two house i will wait five minutes if you could go five minutes and we'll be doing this workshop to let everybody gather around How were the other workshops? Did you make them? Oh, the zoom is very low. Did you see that? How about now? I hear myself with some background noise. So, okay, testing, one, two, three. So, Hamza, you still have no idea of API, but now you know more. That's nice. That's really, really nice. So, the thing about the API is that um, usually you you interact with the API through through an HTTP protocol because you, you go to your web page and you do that and, and everything works fine. But the way that Albert has implemented it is using the, the UWSGI protocol, the U Web Server Gateway Interface. And um, when I was testing it, it didn't accept HTTP requests like Typical ones. If you went to the terminal you and you did like curl localhost and the port, it just didn't work because the 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 port only listened to to requests through the UWSGI protocol. So what are we going to do in order for that to work? Is use nginx, which is an open source proxy or reverse proxy application and it's used worldwide like Apache and we'll, we will be config, configuring it to be able to pass all the HTTP requests through the UWSGI protocol to the socket that the API is listening to. So that's uh, related to the API part. And then after that uh, one one cool thing about nginx, one cool thing about nginx, it's that you can select which requests are going to where. So in particular, it, that's why it's called a reverse proxy. Uh, you could say, for example, in fact, it is what we're doing. If if you have a, a domain name and you have all your services inside that domain inside that server and you want the requests that end with slash API, and you want those requests to be sent to the API, you can do that with Nginx. You just have to set up a, a location rule, it's called a location rule, and you say if the request matches this URL, then you will do such and such. And in this case, we will say that uh, we will redirect the request through the protocol to the socket that the API is listening to. Not exactly to the socket, we will be redirecting it to the upstream server that Nginx has set up. And the upstream server, which is like a, an inside server inside Nginx, the upstream server will redirect that to the socket. Why is it necessary why is it necessary to have this upstream server? Because also Nginx has this capability which is load balancing. Imagine that you have an API that has uh, a, a very big amount of requests and you can you cannot uh, support that with only one API with only one instance with one worker of the API so you need to have many different workers so you could say okay so all these workers belong to the same upstream server and this upstream server is connected to the location rule so you could say for example the 
the location API will be will be redirected to the upstream server, and then I have ten thousand workers. Any of them will do the job, and you forget about that. And Nginx does it for you. I I have to say I never used load balancing because all my projects are like local, so <laughs> I don't have the need to do that. And uh, so take my advice with a grain of salt uh, related to the upstream server, but all the other things uh, sh should be true. Okay, so Docker Compose. Do you have any experience with Docker Compose? Because I, I had prepared like th this, this workshop is heavy on knowledge. Like we're going to set up the, the backend, the front end, the database, and a proxy. So it's heavy on knowledge. So if you, okay, so you say no, you say no, it's your first time. So do you know what Docker images are? Docker images and Docker containers. Yes, you know, there's one that says no. Okay, so I will have to explain that. They say nope, and like a virtual machine, but running a different way. Yeah, that that is true. Yeah. Okay, so so I will I will have to explain that because it's really really important because we will be building containers, we will be building images, and those images will be used in Docker Compose. So I think it's it's good to start with that. So. Um, uh, by the way, we will have la we will have a theoretical explanation in the beginning, and uh, after that we will start coding. So this screen right here is going to stay for a while, and then I will share my screen and we will start coding. So let's start explaining. You have um, so let's imagine let's imagine that I'm running a, a server on Python. And I, I am a developer and I'm running my own server on Python. And I have a colleague, I have a workmate, and he wants to try the server out. And he says, hey, could you please uh, pass me the code? Uh, and I say, yeah, here's the repo, clone it, and test it. And uh, he says, hey, this is not working. It says that some package is not installed and uh, there's some dependencies that something, something. And then we have to troubleshoot it in order in order to work so that it can work the problem with that is that the environment wasn't set up properly the code was good enough but the libraries that were installed in each computer were different so it makes sense that it fails so let's create a virtual environment if the environment is the thing that does not work let's just create a virtual one and you have a Python package which is called, which is called VM from virtual environment, and you can create that. And then you start with an empty Python environment, and you can do pip install and you install all the packages. And uh, then you can output those packages that you have installed. You can freeze them, and you get all the packages in your system with all the versions. And you say, hey, these are the packages that I need you to install. So you send those packages to, to him or her, and they create the virtual environment, and they install that. And that's solved. That is completely solved. Because you have all the same packages, and the code is the same, so the code is running on the same environment. So that's a virtual environment. So what has Docker to do with that? Just imagine that, for example, I am running Ubuntu on Linux, which, in fact, I am. I am running Ubuntu 16. I have to update it. <laughs> I'm running Ubuntu, and let's imagine that someone is using Kali Linux, for example, and um, the packages are different. Let's say some, someone is, is using Arch Linux, uh, which is similar, but there are many, many differences. And uh, I say, hey, I need you to install Node.js, and I need you to test this code. And they say, well, but I cannot, because uh, there are some libraries that you have implemented, and, and, and I have Arch Linux, and it's different. So... So what should we do in that? We we cannot we cannot create a virtual environment when we have different operative si operating systems. So one way to do that is creating a Docker container. Oh, 
or in this case will be to pull the Node.js Docker image. And the, the way it works is that your computer, when, when you run the, in this case, the Node.js image, it asks for the resources in your kernel, in your operating system, and it shares some resources, like for example, the file system or the network drivers. And um, it does so in a way that is completely independent of your platform. So that's like um, a lower level virtual environment. So you could instantiate a, a, a Node.js container in my Ubuntu and in their Kali Linux or Arch Linux and you would have a virtual environment for that specific re for that specific image which in, in this case is Node.js or it could be Python, it could be PHP, it could be Nginx, it could be Postgres. Uh, so there are many images that are like, uh, like they are separated from the operating system and that's that's really cool because you could use that independent of the platform so this this is actually true because when i'm using ubuntu but there's my my colleague david aleo who did the the workshop on react he's using windows and we we worked on the same project because we could use it via docker compose because we installed specific images and those images were independent of the system and indeed uh Taras, you can even create your own and in fact we're doing that in this workshop so that's why some some knowledge on docker is needed for this talk so once you have docker con docker images created the way that you spin them up to spin up a, a service or a, or an image is to create a container and run it a container is mm, okay so imagine that i want to buy a laptop you understand what laptop means but when you buy a laptop you buy a specific one so that that could be the analogy between an image and a container the image is what the container should look like or how it should behave and the container is the running instance the the, the physical thing that is running so uh, you for example you have one image of nginx but you could have five containers of the same image in your computer running at the same time. So once you have containers, imagine that for your own project, in this case, for this project, we want to have different containers, for example, a, a database, a backend, a frontend, and a reverse proxy. So you could run, you could spin up one container and then another, and then another, and then another. You could, you, you could do that uh, independently of each other. But then, if you want to stop one of them, you would have to control C on the on the terminal of the one that is running, and then control C on the other one. You you would have to quit all of them individually. So Docker Compose, what it does is compose them. Surprise, Docker Compose, and it's a tool to orchestrate the containers. It's called uh, container orchestration. So uh, it's really important to know Docker Compose when when you want to have a full-fledged project because in the case that you have for example um, a company let's say and that company has 50 images 50 different images or 50 containers you would use kubernetes in that case because it's distributed um, through multiple hosts multiple com physical computers but if you want to test those images in your computer you could use docker compose you could set up uh, a whole set of containers that you want them to be running at the same time, and then you just use Docker Compose app and surprise, uh, all, all at the same time, create themselves and they spin up and they share common resources. For example, the network drivers. Uh, it's something really cool about Docker Compose is the fact that if you have a service called, in this case, Agenda, because we're doing the Agenda project, if you have a service that is called Agenda Database and you have another service that is called Agenda API, you from your computer cannot 
access each service individually from your computer. But each service, each container, knows the name. And for example, if from the API, I do a request to Agenda Database, because they are sharing the same network drivers created by Docker Compose, they can resolve the name Agenda Database to a specific API on a specific port. That's really cool. That is really cool because that that lets you create a layer of security. If that if this is the external world, if if the people enter your service from here, you don't want people to access your database. So what you do is you create um, a default network driver that will interact with the nginx reverse proxy, and depending on the request, because the nginx proxy shares the network through with all the containers. Then you can say, oh, this is to the API, and this goes to the API, and the API can speak to the database, but you cannot, you being an external person. So that puts a layer of security between your, your services and the external world, and that is, that is super important because no one wants to have their passwords leaked. So that is Docker Compose. I think that's... Uh, um, I think it's a good explanation. Maybe thumbs up if you understood it. If you understood it, I will proceed with with coding. I'll wait till you say something. Yes, let's start coding. Cool. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's... I don't know if it, yeah yeah you are seeing the you are seeing my screen so I did Docker Compose a build and something failed <laughs> and uh, I will have to debug this in a minute. Uh -huh. Cool, okay. Okay, so this should work if I put cool localhost 8090. Yeah, it does work. Cool, and if I put API, welcome to Agenda API, and we see here I get API. Okay, it does work. So let's create the Docker Compose file. And uh, as a consequence, we would have to create the the Docker files for each service. So as we know, we will have an API, we will have a client, we will have a reverse proxy, and we will have a database. So in the beginning, let's create the API and Nginx. Okay, let's do that. Let's quit that, and let's put move docker compose to docker compose that old so we are going to create one docker compose this one so the docker compose starts with the version in this case we will use the 3.5 and it, it has a set of services in this case we want two services it's the agenda api and the agenda database okay so Let's first, this is a comment, the, the hashtag. So let's use first the database. In this case, we will going to be using the Postgres latest image. Let me check uh, very quickly if that is the name of the... Indeed, is Postgres. I was thinking it could be Postgres QL, but it's Postgres. Okay. And um, the container name will be Agenda DB. If we don't put that, the the name of the container will be, I think, Postgres underscore one, uh, because this is the name of the service, and because we want to access 
the the containers, then we should explicitly state the the name of the containers. And uh, in the case that the database fails because it finds something that makes the process halt, we want it to restart. And uh, in every case that the database fails, it will restart. Okay. So after that, we will set up the ports and uh, it uses this one. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so now we will have um, a database. Let's, let's save it. And now let's go to that. Mm -mm. It's the folder on workshops. And if we put docker compose up build, Docker compose is the command. App is the subcommand that you specify to let all the containers spin up. And build means that if you have if you have Docker files um, pending to be built, you will have to build it again. Um, sorry, if you have Docker files, if you have containers that are built with build, you build them again. And that's in case you have changed some some data and you want them to to update the contents of the image with the data that you have changed. So we found orphan containers, of course, <laughs> and we have an error. Mm -hmm. We have to to remove the containers and Oops. yeah Okay, so now we have we have a, an agenda DB, which is the container name, and now it has a spin up. We have an error, and it says that the database is not initialized, and we need a password to initialize it properly. And uh, we have to set up an environment variable, which is Postgres password, or we could use the auth method trust that allows every connection without a password, which of course it's not recommended. So the way to set up an environment variable is to environment and we put postgres password and we say for example agenda one two three four and we save it docker compose up build okay so now it is doing the thing. It is initializing itself. And now the database system is ready to accept connections. On which port? On 5432. That is important. Okay, so after that, we, we can see that there is a thing called Docker Entry Point SH. Hmm, I wonder what that is. Postgres, QL, Docker, Entry Point. And if we look into the documentation, which you should definitely do often, and you say entry point. Initialization scripts. Oh, it makes sense. It makes sense that we need to have initialization scripts because if we're running a database uh, from, from zero, from scratch, how can we create all the tables that we need? We need some way to put the scripts inside the, the container and let, let the database run them when it first starts. So the way to do that is there is a folder called docker entry point init db dot d, which stands for directory, and then every file that is SQL or SH or SQLGZ, it will execute them. In particular, we will put the, the creation of the tables and the users, 
which uh, my colleague Albert has done in the in the talk about the uh, the API, and we will put them here. So, what is the way to be able to put the files that are in my computer inside the the container? There's a thing in Docker called volumes. Remember when I said that in Docker you share resources? So in this case, if we put, for example, db data and we share them with Docker entry point init db dot d, that means that everything that will be inside this folder, which is on the project folder db data, will be inside this. So let's test it out. More in particular, if you want the technical terms, it means that the folder is mounted on this folder. The folder on the host is mounted in the folder of the container. So, in fact, I'm going to put that here. Okay. So now if I go to my directory, I can see that in DB I already have um, a file. So if I Docker Compose a build and I enter the the container. I can indeed hmm. Hmm. Oh wait. Hmm. I should be able to see a file inside. But I am not. How could that be? How could that be? Hmm. Let me check real quick. So, uh, yeah, this is a live coding session. Errors are expected to happen because that's how you learn. Uh, in fact, you should ask my colleague David and my colleague Albert, what did we do yesterday and, and the day before yesterday, we were, we were debugging everything. So this is docker compose, cat docker compose, old. and indeed we have db data in oh this is because it's in it not data mm -mm. okay now if we execute it again we should see okay now ls on docker entry point Boom, we see the file. So now all we have inside the, the, uh, the folder is inside the container. So exec means to run a command inside a specific container, and this is the command that we're running. We are running a terminal inside the database. And uh, what happens if we, for example, create another one? It's on real time because the folder is mounted on the container. So that's an important term. There is a really important term. Okay. Mm. 
Okay, so now that we have the the uh, the volume set up of the the init script, we should be able to also make the data of the database persist. So what happens when I delete the container? That everything that is inside the container, all the data, will be erased. And then when I spin up the container, it will start again. And I don't want that because I have crucial data inside my database. I don't want my data to be erased. I need, I need a way to make them persist. So let's create another volume, which is the data, which is... Let's see, um, Postgres mm -mm, Docker Hub. Let's check the documentation. Let's see where does Postgres store all the all the data. Mm -mm, the default is varlib Postgres data. Yeah. This optional variable can be used to define another location for the database files. So this thing right here, we will copy that and uh, we will paste it here. Okay, and we will save it. So now we have instantiated the database with the necessary ports, with the necessary um, name, with the necessary environment variables and with the necessary volumes. Now we can already create the we can start creating the, the API. Okay, so API, the container name will be Agenda API. And the image, the name will also be Agenda API. But the thing about this is that we don't have a uh, Docker image for the Agenda API. We, we know that it's made on Python and we need some ways to to create a Docker container out of it, a Docker image. The way to do that is through the build key. And in this case, we'll put API. This means that the all the necessary files that let the that let Docker Compose know how to build the, the API, the service, is located inside the folder API. And if we check API, uh, with only two levels, just in case, we will see that the Docker file is indeed in here. Let's check what's inside the Docker file. So here we're loading Python, independent of the platform. It doesn't matter if you're using Ubuntu, Kali, Windows, Mac. It doesn't matter. You're you're going to use Python three point seven no matter what, that's Python 3.7. And we will say that the current directory is slash app, app. Why is that important? Because when you, for example, do copy or run or anything that could require a specific location, now you know where you are. For example, when you instantiate a terminal, by default, you're in the home directory. That's by default. But what happens if I have a script that's inside app? I have to cd app. So that's what work there does. And that is really important because in, in this case, we are going to set up some volumes because we don't want the source code to be copied every single time to the image because creating a Docker image is resource intensive. Not really re resource intensive, but if you can skip that phase, that would be really nice. So the way to do that is just by creating the volume and then let Python load that when the container is instantiated. But you don't need the Docker image to have the source code. You just need it to load it, not to have it, which is really different. Because that means that, for example, imagine that my source code is one gigabyte, for example, because I have so many things. Imagine that I have one gigabyte of source code. I would not want to have a Docker image that is one gigabyte. Uh, who, who would? I wouldn't. So the way to prevent that is just by creating a volume and let the let Docker Compose know that this specific folder, for example, in data, which could contain gigabytes of database files, 
let them know that the folder which is mounted, which is located in my hard drive, in my hard disk, let's assign that to a specific folder. Let's mount it in a specific folder inside the, the container. In this case, we want to put API API to APP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. API source, I think. I have to check how my how Albert did it. So um, I have to check the Docker Compose all just to check if it's just source or the yeah, it's the normal one. It is the normal one. Okay, so now what we're doing, let's clear, I don't want to cheat, so let's clear that. <laughs> so what we're doing is telling telling Docker Compose that the the directory which is called API, which is located inside the the project folder, the same folder in which Docker Compose, this Docker Compose file is located, it will be mounted in slash app inside the container. Okay, but then why are we copying things? We are copying things because because we need the the libraries, the specific libraries that Python will use when we're building the image. Because we don't want to install all the dependencies every single time that we load the image. We just want to install them and when we spin up the service, we spin up the container, everything will be all right. We just have to load the source code, not install anything, just load the source code. So that's why we're copying the requirements and then we're just installing the requirements. And then we're copying the configuration of the web server gateway interface. That's the protocol that I told you about in the very beginning. And then we're copying those those settings and let the the gateway interface run with those settings. So you may be asking, or may not, but I hope you're asking, what's the difference between run and CMD? Because both are commands. I can run pip install in my computer and I can run UWSGI in my in my computer. So what's the difference? The difference is that run is a command that will be run when you're when you're creating the image so when you are building the image well creating building the image is the same when you're creating the image you will run pip install and you will run it once because you're creating the image and you will be running it once only once but when you're doing cmd that's the command that will be run when the container is when the container is spin up is spun up when the container is spun up, this is the command that it will execute. So it makes sense because this is the command that listens to all the, the requests. So we need that when we spin up the service, not when we build the image. So that's the difference between run and CMD. So in this case, um, we have the uh, the image, which will, be, which will have that name, the container name that will have that name, the folder that contains the build instructions we are sharing the volume but now we need something we need to expose a port because it, it it doesn't make sense to have a server that cannot listen to anything so we need to tell docker to tell docker compose that a specific port on the container should be um, released into the outside where outside is our host computer it's the laptop that i'm working right now so let's say ports and um, to check what port is it, it's in here, it's that socket. So we'll put 98. So you may be asking, or may not, but I hope you are asking, hey Allah, what's the difference between this line and this line and why is it different? Why are why are we not putting 9080 colon 9080? It's a really good question. And the thing is, in this case, we are telling Docker Compose that the port 5432 in the container will be the same as the 5432 in our host computer. Which means that if I'm going to, for example, do core localhost, 
Now it won't work because the Docker Compose isn't running. But if I'm doing this, it will be the same as querying the the ins the, the port inside the container. If I did, for example, uh, fifth, I don't know, 5400, I will have to put 5400. Because that port is the port that I'm that I'm opening in my own computer, but this is the port that is open inside the container, and uh, the way that the, those two ports are linked are via the the network driver that Docker Compose handles, which is the default network driver, which is a bridge. In case you are you want to look for more information. Um, so let's put that as before. So in this case, we do not want to expose that port in our host computer. We only want to let Docker Compose know that this port is open. Why? Why? Why are we doing that? And the reason for that is that we are not listening on HTTP protocols. We are listening on Web Server Gateway Interface. So if we try to open a web browser with 9080 or we try to do a curl with 9080, it, it just won't happen. It won't happen because we are not speaking the same language. When you do curl with something, with google.com for example, you are speaking the HTTP protocol. But when you're, when you're speaking through that socket, you're not speaking HTTP, you're speaking Web Server Gateway Interface, this specific protocol. And it, you just it doesn't do anything. It will say connection refuse or connection reset because it, it wouldn't make any sense to speak that way. So that's why we need to set up Nginx to let the... To, that's why we need to set up Nginx to transform the protocol. Nginx acts as a proxy, as a reverse proxy in this case, and it will listen to a request, an HTTP request to a specific port that we will set up later, and it will say, oh, this is to the API. I know what to do with the requests that are made to the API. I have to transform the protocol. And we will we will put in the configuration of Nginx, we will put a specific line that is that is um, uwsgi underscore pass, which it redirects it, transforming the protocol. And we will put it to the upstream server, as I explained in the very beginning. We will see that in a second. So this is the port. We do not want to expose the port locally because we would not understand it. So we just want to let Docker Compose know that this port is open. Okay, and um, I think that would be enough to load the API and the DB. I don't think there are any environment variables or anything. Let me check real quick. DB, this is all good. The API image container build. Oh, it depends on. Oh, this is really interesting. That's really important. I will tell it in a second. Ports, volumes, and common. Okay. So for all, it's it's quite it's quite similar. There are some things that uh, that are different, and in more specifically, it's this one. And it it makes sense to speak about that because we had some problems when we were configuring this with Albert. Um, Okay, so naturally, a database has to do more configurations in the very beginning. When you are when you are loading the database, you have to initialize it. You have to to do some internal operations, and then you're ready to listen to connections. Then you're ready. Not not in the very beginning. You have to wait a little bit. And there are some 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 projects that I've seen that wait five seconds, and uh, they load up the database. And five seconds after, they load the API. Because that way you make sure that the database is ready to listen. Because what happens if, for example, in my company, in my own company, in a production-ready environment, I load the database. It's not ready yet, but I load it, but it's not ready. And at the same time, I load the API. There may be people, there may be clients, there may be future buyers of my service that will try to access some information and it will receive an error because the database is not ready yet. The API will make a request and it will say connection refused and then you will lose a customer. So the way to do that is to let 
Docker Compose know in a way, in some way, that the API has to be loaded after the database. And that is made with the depends on clause. And in this case, we put agenda DB. That means that once the this image is built, then we build the API because it has some dependencies. Okay, so I have... Mm, Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a detail here. Depends on uh, sets a dependency on build time, but not on runtime. So that means that the DB is created first, the image is created first, and then the API is created. Uh, but we do not want that. We we want that the API is initialized after the database is ready to listen. And Docker Compose has nothing to do with it. That's the problem, that Docker Compose has nothing to do for it. And the way to solve that is to have a script called wait for it. And you have, of course, in the documentations, you need a way to control the order of, of the startup and shutdown of the services. And there is a way with depends on, and that is really good, but that's on build time. Uh, on, on build time and also runtime, but it just it tells Docker Compose that first is going to be the database and then the API, but it doesn't do any. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that the database could be listening or not. It just says first spin up the database and then spin up the API. I don't care if the database is ready or not. I just want the database run first and then the API. So if you need to check that the database is ready to listen, you use tools such as wait for it. And it's a pure bus script that will wait on the availability of a host and TCP port. In this case, we'll put wait for it, agenda DB 5432, with a timeout of zero, because we, we want to wait indefinitely, um, of course zero for no timeout, and then we will put the command args. We have seen that the, the command, in this case, when we check the docker file of the API, the command is this one. So we need to replace that, because we do not want to run that in the very beginning. We want to wait until the database is ready. So to do that, we do the command, and we say, wait for it, agenda db. <laughs> that reminds me of how I met your mother. <laughs> Wait for it. So we put agenda DB, the port, the timeout zero, and then we have to put the command, which is um, web server gateway interface, any web server gateway interface dot any. And that's it. And that should be all. But then you will say, oh, wait, if this is a script that we saw on GitHub, that means that it's not ready by default on the on the Docker file. So the way that we solve that is because we we need that script for other services that we're going to set up. So in our project, we set up this bin folder that contains wait for it, and of course it has the the execute thing. If you save that, if you copy the file and uh, save that to a place, you need to schmod x that file. Keep that in mind, because you cannot run a script without executing privileges. So you need to schmod x that one. And the way to do that is to create another volume and say, what's inside bin will be mounted, well, in that case, the file wait for it sh will be mounted inside the file wait for it with or without sh really it does not matter i i like the commands to not have any extension um, so i will put just wait for it and in this case it should work everything is set up let's try it. docker compose up build So now I'm building my thing, my my image, and uh, 
and here it says wait for it waiting for agenda db5432 without a timer agenda db5432 is available after zero seconds cool that is because we did not have to wait until the database is ready because it, it, it definitely is ready it has nothing to initialize but what happens if for example we remove i have to put sudo because the 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 contents of the folder is from root if i delete everything inside the database and now i do db that data So things in here should have been deleted, but they have not. That's strange. That is really strange. I have deleted them. Okay, okay. Now it is deleted. Now I have to make the directory. And uh, in it, okay, so data. Okay, so if I put the Docker Compose again and I build it, first it starts the DB and then the API. And now it says that should no, this isn't what is supposed to happen. I deleted everything in data. It should have to initialize again. Okay, um, because of time reasons, because of time reasons, I will not debug this. Um, have a leap of faith. And the thing is that uh, if the data folder is empty, then uh, Postgres will initialize and will, it. I think it, it's a minute long and the API will stop for a minute and then it will say, Okay, now is available after some seconds, and then you could start doing requests. That's what happens. It doesn't happen right now. I'm sorry. That's problems of live coding. Okay, so now if we have to, if we want to to uh, redirect all the all the requests made. Or the HTTP requests made to localhost, and we want to redirect them to the UWSGI protocol, we need Nginx. And as before, we have to set up the image, set up the container name. Uh, in this case, we don't need a build. We don't want that for now. And the Nginx depends first on the database and then on the API, because we do not want to redirect requests if the API is not ready. Why should you want to redirect something to something that is not ready? So let's just put depend. And in this case, volumes, we will have um, what is inside the Nginx folder. It is Nginx. We have a configuration and a log. Okay, that's important. The configuration in this case, it's called Nginx conf and it's mapped to the to the default configuration file of Nginx, we want to override it. And the reason for that is because we have specific settings and the default settings that Nginx have do not match with what we want right now. So the the file that is inside Nginx conf, which is Nginx conf, will be Nginx conf, Nginx conf, will be matched to this one through the volumes. That means that any change that we do to this file will be replicated to this file. But in a way that is not, it's not, the changes are not copied. It's just, it's the same file. It's mounted on the same file. And the other thing is that the logs that we want, right, the logs that we want to check, for example, the access log and the error log, we want also to be able to read them through the host computer. We do not want to enter the container every single time just to check if there is an access or an error. So let's just put that here. And the directory, I think it's this one, if I remember correctly. How to check it? Let's just put nginx log path. 
and that's var log nginx. Okay, var log nginx. And what did I put? Var nginx log. Okay, var log nginx. And uh, of course, we need to expose some ports. In particular, it's the 8080 or 8090, let's say. And we want to redirect that to the port 80. That means that on localhost 8090, all the requests will be redirected to the port 80 on the nginx. And the command is um, wait for it agenda API on the port 9080 with a timeout of zero. And we want to load nginx um, g diamond off. And uh, to check that, you have to check the documentation. Um, if you check on GitHub, if you check the Docker file for the nginx image, you see that the command is nginx g daemon off. That's important. If you need to modify anything about an, an image, check the Docker file because you need the command. So let's do it again. It's nginx daemon off, and we have to wait until the the port 9080 on agenda api and um, that's everything for nginx it is important to to check the contents of the configuration and in this case we are doing ha, that was nginx log uh, because we have put var nginx log error log, that means that all the errors are going to be that are going to be written in that uh, in that file. The same happens with the accesses. All the HTTP accesses are going to be written here, and that means that all the files that are written inside the container in this folder are going to be the same of those files inside this folder in the host computer. So we can just check. We can we could do for example a like cat. just cat nginx log access and we will have everything here so and it's, and it's updated real time so that's really cool if you want to debug anything then um, these are some things for headers HTTP headers to control the size and we are saying that for all the HTTP requests we are going to listen to the port 80 uh -huh, it makes sense we are going to include the um, the specific types. Okay, so when when you make a request and you access an a txt txt file, there is a type associated with it to let the browser know which type of file it is. So that's that. Uh, and then you say include the uwsgi params, and that's necessary because we have a service that is speaking only in that language. So we're saying that. Every request that matches this rule, that means it starts with API and then has something behind, it will be redirected to agenda, which is this server right here, which is agenda API 9080. And it will be written as such. All the things that are after the API, that's the, the path. That's the dollar one. That's this. Dollar one is this thing right here. And... Uh, if we test this, we build the API. Um, we start the DB. Mm -hmm. ha. We do not have wait for it. Why don't we have wait for it? Because I did not put the volume. bin wait for it sh will be bin wait for it and we save and we clear the screen with docker compose okay the database is ready to listen uh, nginx is also available and API is also available. So what happens when we curl localhost on 8090 on API? 
Welcome to Nginx. Okay, Nginx works. And um, it does not redirect us to the API. And that is because we need that trailing slash. Haha, <laughs> bingo. Welcome to Agenda API. It works. And we see that if we curl every time, the API records that request. And if we check, for example, CV, uh -huh, uh -huh. and if we follow the accesses of Nginx, we can see that it updates. This is the second, and this is the file on the on the on my computer, not inside the container. But because it's in a volume, then all works. So now the way the the thing that is left for this uh, project to be finished is the client. Is the client that that Aleu did, and for that we have to to set up the image name, the container name, agenda client. It depends. Does it depend on anything? The client? No, it does not. Why it does not? Because the client is just files. So you don't need the client for the API or anything. Just they are files. So it does not depend with anything. And um, in this case, we do want to build it from the Docker file inside client. And uh, do we need any volumes? Not that I know of. Because we know we do not want to share anything with the client. We just want to build the production ready files of React. And uh, that's it. We don't want to share it real time or anything. We just want to build it and copy it. And that's it. Mm -mm. So volumes none. Ports? No. Nope. Command? Mm. We could. But there is a way to. <laughs> there is a way to check if we need a command or not. And that is to check the Docker file. What does it do? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so the objective for the client, the thing is when you are trying to build a production ready environment, uh, the thing you do with the, with the web client is you create the production files. You create the production ready files. You, you build the files and once you have all the static files in place, because it's running on the front end, you don't need a server to be running. You just need the HTML files and the JavaScript files and the CSS and the images. Then once you have it, you just have to copy it somewhere. In this case, we want to copy it in Nginx. All the requests that are not to the API, it, it will be the client. So in this case, we have set up that this is the place where the... the um, the client will be stored, the client static files will be stored, and uh, we will try the file, we will try a directory, and if not, we'll just say the that the index HTML is the place to go. And uh, in this case, we are not sharing a volume in the Nginx. This folder is, is local to the container. So to be able to link that, we need a way to tell Nginx to copy the files of the client to the local folder and uh, first we have to let me check real quick the docker compose all yeah true because we are doing <laughs> because we are doing an npm install we will have a big 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 node modules folder so we want to create a volume to let docker compose know that this folder right here needs to persist you don't want to install every single time because that means that the build process which already is long enough that means that it will last a long time because you have to install everything so we create this volume so let's put that yeah and another thing that is quite 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 interesting is that we see in the docker file that there there are no no cmd commands it's just run that means that when the containers is spun up, it doesn't do anything. It just dies. The container spun, spins up, and then it exits because it it has nothing to do. It's just it build it built its stuff, and and that's it. 
So that means that if we put restart always, which by the way in here nginx if it fails it has to restart every single time. The same happens with the database and the same happens with the API. So if the client dies just when it starts, that means that all the time it will be spun up. We don't want that. We, we just want the image to be built and that's it. So restart no. That's the option. Restart no. And uh, now indeed it's what we want. Okay. So we save it. And uh, there's one thing that we didn't do, which is set up Nginx to copy the files. And that is a that's a, a thing in uh, in 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 Docker when when you are creating Docker files, if you have an image and you need a specific set of files from that image, but only that specific set of files, you can set up a multi-stage build, which is called if you want to look it up, it's multi-stage build which is you build an image following stages. And in this case, we do not want to, to load the latest image from Nginx. We want to load the, we want to build the Docker file that is inside Nginx. And if we check the Docker file that is in, inside the folder Nginx, we will see that is almost exactly the same, almost. But there's one thing. It's Nginx latest, but the thing is that from agenda client, this thing right here, we want to copy the app build, the the production ready static files. We want to put it inside the folder that that will be served, and uh, now that's it. That's it. Let's test it. Let us test it. Post build. Start service agenda client. Did I do Docker Compose now? No, I didn't. Now I'm creating the network. That that network makes all the services available to each other. Because instead of using the, the driver that is inside my laptop, uh, the services are using the network driver, Docker Compose Default. And that has some DNS rules, those domain name services rules that specify that, for example, if the API wants to access the database, it can just say Agenda DB, and that's it. Agenda DB colon 5432, and it will be ready. So the client exited with code zero, of course, because the client does not do anything. It just builds builds stuff. I already did it using the cache because it takes a long time. And after that, uh, the database is initializing. This is ready. And if I do curl localhost on 8090 API, it works. And if I do this thing right here, that's the minified code, and if we check it on localhost, boom, boom, it's done. We built a production ready system from scratch in one day with the help of Albert Suarez, David Aleu, and me. Which, by the way, we, we are not those guys. <laughs> those are not our pictures, but those are our real names. And uh, I hope you guys liked it. And, um, and um, yeah, questions. I'm sorry that I did not read everything before. I was pretty focused. Um, the thing with the microphone, the thing with Docker, now it's my first time. How many differences is it? Mm -mm. 
It will persist the data. It depends. Yeah. Okay, so the thing with, with your questions is that it's out of context. <laughs> I'm reading it and I appreciate the fact that you were listening. I appreciate your time, but I don't know when you said it, so I just cannot answer you. If you have any, if you have any, um, any questions right now, there's a, there's a really good one. Why didn't you mount node modules on your local file system? It's a really good question. And the thing is that I'm not entirely sure, but I think node modules is system dependent. So that means that if I copy my node modules to your node modules, that would fail. That could fail. Uh, because my system could be different from yours. So um, if you, for example, uh, we, we saw that in the Docker file of the client that the Docker file of the client loads node Alpine. It loads the Alpine image of node. So it could happen that the system that Node Alpine runs on, it's different than mine, which indeed it is because it's Alpine and mine is Ubuntu. So if we share the Node modules, that means that when I do locally npm run or npm install, I will have a, a Node modules. But if I put uh, that specific folder Node modules, which is shared through the volume and I run it on the Node Alpine, it could fail. So another solution could be to just put node modules underscore container, for example, and have two folders. But then why would you want to have two folders in your same project? Then you would have to add a rule in git ignore to ignore that second folder. So when you do not specify the folder, the, the host folder to which to which to map the, the volume, automatically it is mapped to slash var lib docker volumes something, something, something. So th there is a folder, a specific folder in your host computer, but it's handled by Docker Compose. You just, you do not, you do not do anything. It just automatically, it does it for you. But the thing, it's a really good question. Uh, it is mounted on the local file system. Whenever you put a volume, only one specific part of the volume, it is mounted on the local file system. It just, it is not mounted on your project folder. It is mounted on some specific Docker Compose folders. Okay, you need to set it up with only a YAML or you can use more than one Docker Compose. Oh, that's a really good question. That is indeed a really good question. I know that you can use Docker Compose um, dash F from file and then specify the YAML file. But I don't know if you can use more than one at the same time. Uh, I know that you can use environment variables, which are not inside the scope of this workshop. Um, you can use that and you can change the .env file to change the port of the API, for example. And, uh, and then Docker Compose automatically reads that. But you cannot use more than one at the same time. It's a really good question. You could use a template engine if that is if that could be a valid answer. You could set up a template engine and you specify the, the parameters and then you say, okay, use those parameters that I need in particular, but that, that's the same thing as changing the dot M. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. So one hour and 15 minutes I hope it was interesting. Uh, th there's so many things to say about Docker Compose. You just we, we're just scratching the surface in here. We we didn't get to the to the network drivers. I wanted to put some extra layer of security and have an external an external driver and an internal driver. Um, but but yeah, we're just scratching the surface. It's super powerful, Docker Compose. I really love it. Like every single project that I do, I do it in Docker Compose. Even if it's just an API, I just do it in Docker Compose. It's it's really, really nice. Um, can you next talk me about how to set up i3 that good? You have a lot of short keys. <laughs> yeah, I've been using i3 for I think three, four years. 
and every single maybe every single month I do some upgrade to my configuration like I have everything set up uh, so that I don't have to use my mouse and that's something that uh, one one dear friend of mine Marcelino Coy Marce if you're listening you're the real G man so he <laughs> he had this this idea that all all mouses all all the, all the devices should be eliminated, and he just wanted to to put to to do things with the the with the keyboard, and he was like, yeah, it makes sense because every time you're writing and then you move your hand to the to the mouse, you, you waste time, and it's a valuable time that you you can use to think. So I have everything set up. Everything set up in my in my keyboard. Yeah, I do have a lot of hotkeys, and I have automatic scripts. It could it could be I could I could ha- I could do a talk about i three if I have to speak with with hackers at TPC. Hey, could I just give a talk about i three? <laughs> so, um, what did you think about the workshop, guys? Uh, did you like it? Do, did you think that it was too long? Did you think that it was short? Um, would you like to know more about Docker Compose? Um, what are your general feelings about this workshop? I think that I went too fast. Uh, and, and that I did it with what we had. And I, didn't, I couldn't explain you the, the thought process of creating the Docker Compose, because of course, when you're creating a project, you have to you have to start small, and then you're building up, and that's what I tried to do by just creating the database, and the API, then the nginx, and then the client. Um, did you like it? I hope I hope you did. That'd be really nice. Cool. So I will wait until one last question. And then I will finish the workshop. I liked it and I think that I understand it, but I don't know if I would be able to do it myself. Yeah, that's the thing, man. That's the thing. I... The, when when I have to do some workshops, I did some yesterday. Yesterday I did I did a workshop on pull requests for GitHub. Uh, yesterday I I did a workshop for uh, pull requests on GitHub, and uh, the way that I did it was to do it incrementally, to to let people know that it's it's one thing to listen and another thing to apply the knowledge. So I always try to make my workshops be as interactive as possible uh, in, in the sense that I want to put myself in your place and say, oh shit, this is not working. Why is it not working? Let's check the documentation. And, and, and I'm trying to replicate that thought process, but it's really difficult when, when you're just behind the screen. If you were like right here beside me, I could teach you something. But yeah, it's the, it's the thing about workshops, you know. It's getting dark. <laughs> it's going to be fun to look again at the workshop and see how the background was all lit up. And now it's just only my face. <laughs> That's going to be funny. Cool. So I'm going to finish my to finish the workshop. I, I really appreciate the fact that 23 people have have been uh, listening to what I said. I hope that you really uh, understood the things and really want to apply it to your next project. Docker Compose is really, really, really powerful. It's just unbelievably, unbelievably powerful. You can do so much. You can set up entire companies on Docker Compose. In fact, the company I work for runs Docker Compose. That's that's really really cool. Uh, if you have anything to say to me personally, if you want to have a beer with me any day, uh, my 
My handle on Instagram is alamoucharrafie. I will write it right here right now. My handle on social media, on Instagram basically, I don't use any other social media, is alamoucharrafie. And uh, you can add me on LinkedIn. Oh, really? Do I have to log in in Twitch? Shit. But it's alamoucharrafie. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for listening and we'll see you in the in the next workshop. Have fun, take care and stay at home. Bye.